that. Um, so we're now on item 10, which we are racing along. Item 10 is a fantastic item, so grab your seats and enjoy your coffee while we while we have our presentation on our end of year report on our natural environment rate and our water targeted rate. We've done good stuff and this is a chance to really understand what an extraordinary job our teams have done and also as a bit of a thank you to Aucklanders saying you voted for and supported the water targeted rate and the environment targeted rate and this is what we've done with it. Just before anyone asks, um, this is not going to give you today the breakdown and the um, ward by ward breakdown. That's going to be available after we have the audited accounts in September, so it's coming soon, but you have all been sent the snapshot for your local board area. And I know that that was something people were, were passionate about, so just a little bit more and it will be with you soon. Right, thanks, Gail. Uh, kia ora koutou and thank you, Penny. So just over a year ago around this table, uh, the governing body made the decision to support both the natural environment and the water quality targeted rates. And that's given us as an organisation, I think, an opportunity to really complete a bit of a step change in the work that we're doing ourselves, but also as, if not more importantly, the work we're doing to support others, particularly the community groups that are working on improving either conservation, biodiversity type outcomes or improvements in water quality. So, yeah, that's the plus side. The plus side is that we have growing support and significant appetite for people, interest in now improving the natural environment on the counter side to that, we also have some pretty large challenges in terms of climate change, in terms of invasive pest and animal uh, uh, numbers, and in terms of habitat modification from growth of the city. So there's a, there's a big job in front of us, but these targeted rates um, allow us to make huge progress in the right direction. I'll just briefly go through some of the highlights of the natural environment targeted rate and then I'll pass on to Craig to talk about the water quality targeted rate and Mace has also kindly offered to be here with us to help with any questions particularly related to any parks work. So for, on the natural environment rate side, uh, the option B that was supported by these, this governing body gave us a fourfold increase over a 10 year period. We were spending on a range of different outcome areas about 10 million per annum, and we're now able to spend uh, on average about 40 million per annum on those outcome areas. And the outcome areas that are key uh, with respect to the targeted rate are listed up there. So the flagship really has been about reducing the spread of Kari disease. Uh, there's also a significant expansion in our programs, what we used to call walking the talk. So making sure that on the council estate, both in the regional and local, local parks, we were carrying out best practice animal and weed control, uh, supporting community-led conservation, uh, protecting the Hauraki Gulf Islands from pest incursions, and also controlling marine pests under the waterline, providing greater protection for uh, in the marine space for the shorebirds and seabirds, high value freshwater lakes, and then underpinning those environmental outcomes. Uh, I've mentioned before, uh, with respect to this targeted rate, over the last seven or eight years, we've really under-invested in the technological support platforms that we need to actively manage the natural environment, and that includes uh, the platforms we have for our spatial ecological data and some of our connections with ratepayers, like bioportals and customer relationship management systems. So the work is being planned and delivered uh, across a range of council departments. 
This morning, actually, I counted up 12. There are at least 12 different council departments that are working together um, to deliver these improvements and meet those objectives that I've just described. Uh, the key ones are listed there, environmental services, our colleagues in parks, colleagues in community facilities, research investigations and monitoring and also regulatory. We're also, there's quite um, a lot of synergy between some of the, particularly the community work being done and the healthy waters targeted rate. So Craig and I are working closely together to make the most of those synergies in terms of that support for community groups. And then on the conservation side specifically, uh, as you know, Department of Conservation moved into our building some time ago now, um, and that's really helped with the direction of travel we're already taking, making sure that Auckland Council support was lined up with DOC support in these areas. Uh, throughout the, um, the programs, it's, I'd say it was early days at this stage still with respect to building in uh, Maori responsiveness, but we have started some good work on three fronts. One is Maori-led projects, so um, giving rangatiratanga um, back to those Maori groups that are interested in leading uh, projects to improve natural environment outcomes. The second area is uh, building capacity and capability across our iwi. And then the third area that we're investing in is making sure there's quite a lot of um, uh, overlap between the kaupapa from many of our iwi groups and improvements in the natural environment. So what we're trying to do with across the board with all of our projects is make sure that we're not only delivering on those environmental biodiversity type outcomes, but we're also delivering on cultural outcomes. So we've got a, uh, a measurement and monitoring framework in place to achieve that. Uh, the other point to note there is this last year that I'm talking about this morning uh, is one of the uh, build years. So the program is building over a three year period um, till it gets to that, um, that sort of plateau level of about 40 million a year from then through to the end of the LTP. Uh, there's quite a lot of material in, in the report uh, that you've had leading up to this meeting. Uh, some key highlights on the numbers. The three big programs in the targeted rate are the Kairi Daibat work, the work on our parks and the work to support communities. So on Kauri Dieback, uh, you see some of the results there, the 26 kilometres of tracks that have been upgraded over the last year, um, eight open tracks. Of course, the public would like that number to be higher, as I think Mace well knows, uh, but we've got eight tracks open to date and certainly plans um, in place to continue opening those tracks once the work gets to a Kauri safe standard. Uh, that number there on the phosphite uh, work I think is important for a couple of reasons. One, we're doing operational testing of the efficacy of phosphite as a way to build tree immunity to protect them from the disease. And secondly, a lot of that work is with private landowners. So that's responding to requests from private landowners that have kauri in their properties and want to know the health of those kauri and what they can do to protect that. And then some of those numbers there in terms of our support for community groups, um, you know, a threefold increase in um, what we can provide to community groups. Uh, and that's through uh, resourcing, like funding, providing tools, providing technical advice, and for pro providing a lot of co coordination type support as well. And finally, just across on the park side, uh, threefold increase in some of our animal programs across our park estate. And at the local park level, we've got now upwards of 120 local parks that we're carrying out some improved best practice weed and animal control, and also some work in the buffer areas around those parks. Just a few um, overheads, just focusing on each of the outcome areas. Uh, I've covered really the highlights on uh, 
the, the Kauri work, uh, just really to make the point that it is uh, work that's been carried out in both regional parks and local parks. The local park track upgrade work is slightly behind the regional park work because before we started a year ago, we had to first better understand the health of Kauri across our 4,000 local parks and then sort of overlay that Kauri health uh, picture with the um, current state of the tracks and also the recreational uh, pressure on those tracks. So that's work we've done very closely with parks and we've now got a good program um, for track upgrades that have started but we'll be building up this financial year across the 11 local board areas that have reasonable stands of Kauri. Protecting our parks I've talked about with respect to both the the weed and the pest animal control. Uh, one of the projects we're really excited about is uh, the ability to put a uh, more intensive and larger buffer area around Hanua's to protect the investment that we've made through uh, Project Hanua, which was the aerial bait drop. Expanding community action, um, you'd, you'd, many of you would be familiar with our work there uh, and there's quite a lot of information in the uh, material in the report but also as, as Councillor Hulse mentioned we've uh, sent around 21 snapshots to each of the local board areas and that has quite a lot of detail on the work that we've done to support a whole range of projects you know from, from smaller very locally based reserve work through to some of our more substantive corridor work like the Eastern Songberg project, the Northwest Wild Link project, that sort of connectivity to build those corridors across the area. We're also seeing, and I think this reflects what I was mentioning earlier, the growing natural um, environment awareness across Auckland. We're also seeing record turnout at things like our regional festivals um, that are happening around the country, around the country, around Tamaki Makaurau now, and also um, our region-wide one, which is scheduled for Conservation Week. The, in the marine space, uh, which is an important area for us, uh, you know, typically important, but even more so because of the America's Cup uh, coming up and the, um, the, the opportunity there where we'll have quite a lot of international focus on the beauty of our Haraki Gulf and its natural environment. So I mentioned earlier we were doing work, what I call below the waterline, which is our marine biosecurity work. That's quite challenging. We've got a large uh, number of uh, new, quite invasive marine pests um, that are moving into our harbours, partly influenced by increasing water temperatures. Uh, so, and those invasive pests are quite hard to manage within the water column. So that's work we're doing. We now have a better understanding of the current state in our harbours and we're doing work to try and minimise the spread of those pests with other uh, councils around the region. Uh, above the waterline on the islands, we've got some focused uh, pest control programs on the various islands. You would be familiar with Te Korowai or Waiheke, which is our big program in Waiheke to eliminate um, rats, possums and stoats. Uh, we've also um, got uh, some work focused on shorebird and seabirds. Um, New Zealand, as you know, is the seabird capital of the world. So we've got some quite innovative work. Um, that picture there is actually a 3D printed image of a spotted shag, which is up with another number of those um, and the latest digital sound control to try and encourage spotted shags to that breeding uh, area. We've also got on the right hand side there, we're really proud of our biosecurity dogs. We've now got 14 biosecurity dogs. Uh, they're housed in a compound in the domain. Um, very happy to take tours if anyone wants to come and look at our biosecurity dogs. And that's uh, one there that got a lot of media coverage uh, recently when Mayor Phil Goff came down to the waterfront and saw um, Kosher arriving on an electric bike. 
So they're doing a lot of really good work. It's very, very effective to use dogs in um, surveillance on vehicle ferries and domestic ferries. People are really interested and uh, they're very effective at detecting pests. A small program in biosecurity, which is, sorry, freshwater biosecurity, which is largely focused on our high priority lakes. In terms of the year ahead, uh, there'll be ongoing work to further extend uh, the, um, the, the track improvement program. Uh, we've estimated that for this financial year across the regional and also local park network, we'll be able to complete another 93 kilo kilometres of track upgrades, which builds on the 26 that we completed this year ongoing expansion of our weed and pest animal control, and a lot of that will be part of implementing the Regional Pest Management Plan, continued support for community groups and landowners, and identifying opportunities to um, continue that direction of travel that we're taking um, to build uh, a cultural lens into all of our environmental work. So I'll pass over to Craig now. I really appreciate the opportunity to have taken you through those results for the year. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gail. Um, yeah, just want to briefly talk about the water quality targeted rate. And it started, I'd like to acknowledge the relationship we've got with Watercare at the moment. Watercare aren't here today, but Watercare being a big part of the success we've had in the West Isthmus work, and I'll talk more about that briefly. But like Gail, this is all about um, partnerships and teamwork, and we're also involved in a number of key partners and stakeholders across the region. And it's only with the success of those relationships that we can actually deliver our programs. So we've got five um, program areas. The Western Isthmus program, contaminant reduction, urban and rural stream rehab, our on-site wastewater compliance, and our safe networks program. So I'll just talk briefly about each of those in turn. But before I do it, here's just a graphic that really just highlights, I guess, some of the achievements that have been achieved in the year. Um, I don't intend to focus on any of those specifically. Obviously, very happy to answer any questions, but suffice it to say, I think the success of this program is that we've actually hit the ground running. So this program was actually taking a 30-year work program and hoovering it up into 10 years. And what you quickly realise when you're developing a 10-year programme is if you don't hit the year running on day one, before you know where you are, you're at the end of year one and you're 10% of the way through the programme. So I think the real success to these types of initiatives is do your planning, get your ducks lined up and be prepared to um, keep the foot down on the accelerator and that's the only way you can actually achieve your outcomes. So on the Westmus Isthmus programme, there's actually been a, a, a key focus on two areas. One is the, the northern catchments that are past where the water care central interceptor will provide the servicing. And so we've been focusing very much on our projects around the Daldy Street outfall and the St Mary's Bay uh, stormwater tunnel project. Water care has now committed to full separation of St Mary's Bay and Hearn Bay catchment. So that deals ultimately in the next four to five years with the water quality outcomes in those particular areas. The rest of the work is really linked to water care central interceptor programs. So the central interceptor program has three key milestones. The first is the piece from the Mungary treatment plant to Keith Hay Park. The second is from Keith Hay Park to Western Springs. And the third is from Western Springs to Greylin. So what we've agreed with water care is that when they commission the first stage of the project, all of the other works that provide for the water quality improvements will come online at the same time. So when the first stage of the tunnel is commissioned, all of the catchment issues inside those catchments will be addressed at the same time. I think that way we can get the maximum benefit and bang for our buck. So able to align that planning has made a huge difference to the, I guess, providing the public with the early wins in respect of those water quality outcomes. The Safe Networks program has been a real eye-opener to us. As we get in and look at the forensics, at what's happening on the beaches, you realise that there's nowhere to hide. Um, with the Safe Swim website, everything is in the public domain. 
It's really put the pressure on both healthy waters and water care to understand the network performance at quite a detailed level and also means that we can then look and put in, put in place the necessary fixes. So this really is quite an intensive program because as you know when it comes to water and pipes the devil is always in the detail and it's easy to generalise um, outcomes but it's not till you get in and measure the specifics that you can actually deal with specific issues. Our urban um, and rural stream rehabilitation program has been, um, is really travelling extremely well and one of the exciting things we're doing in this space is developing tools to model uh, what happens on the land based part of the network. It's by having a better understanding of what that sediment load is and where that sediment is coming from not only gives us the ability to predict what's going to happen in the future with our water quality, but I think it's going to be a critical tool around our future decisions, around future urbanisation of greenfield areas. It's going to take a lot of the... Um, it's going to provide a lot better science around what is the impact of different areas being developed and what controls will be necessary to manage sediment, etc. So I think this is a very, very powerful tool. We've also given out uh, $360,000 in grants this year to 26 community groups. Sorry, when I say this year, I mean the year that's just gone by, and that will be intended to be continued into the future. So right, where to from here? So at the moment we've got um, a major focus, as I've mentioned, on the Dawley Street and Freeman's Bay catchment, so we're not only extending the the pipe uh, to the end of the uh, wharf and Daldy Street, but also we've got a separation project underway in Freeman's Bay. We're doing free, uh, Aikahu Bay uh, stormwater separation works, and we're very close to being able to push the go button on St Mary's Bay. We're just in the final stages of uh, Environment Court mediation at the moment. Also, we've got uh, water treatment devices going into our town centre upgrades. The Safe Networks investigations is going to continue, and this is something that's just going to continue on an ad infinitum basis. Continue with our community grant schemes, and definitely the way that we work with Maori is extremely important, and we're totally committed to making a success of our Mataranga Maori approach within our programs. And that's pretty much uh, our brief presentation, so Gail and myself and Mace are obviously delighted to answer any questions. Okay, quick questions. Councillor Cooper. And Thank Councilor you, Cooper and it is, um, it really is the highlight in some ways of our 10-year budget, this environmental and water quality target rates. Um, we have a, quite a bit of raru raru around the track closures and then the opening, particularly in our regional park and the ranges. And I guess I just want to hear your views on the fact that, you know, we've had to close them, but now we're opening them, you know, in a staged way, a consulted way, and that now we're getting a bit of a pushback and saying they're overly sanitised. Um, I guess, is, have you got any kind of view on that? I mean, being the experts on this, what's the alternative? I guess. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Councillor Cooper. It, yeah, the, the notion that overly sanitised, I guess we are meeting the dry track standard that is envisaged by the, the um, National Curry Dieback Pest Management Plan. Uh, so we, we've always been taking an adaptive and precautionary approach that has led to a, to a surface that is more accessible. Um, but um, we, our objective is to protect kauri, and so that's that's what we're doing. What I can say, though, is in the Waitakere Ranges, we have had a 9.5% increase in visitation across um, parks in the west, um, so that's 230,000 more people um, that, we have had, that we have had across the Waitakere Ranges. Also on tracks like Kitty Kitty, which are major destinations in Piha, um, 220,000 visitors to that track last year despite being closed for three months. So our visitor profile is changing um, and the needs of those that changing visitor profile, um, I would suggest Councillor Cooper is a higher level of um, standard service level for those for those tracks to keep people safe. And I guess 
that's the angst for local people who that is their backyard and they, you know, for them it's like you're taking away the wilderness. I guess what, is this the trade-off we have if we want to keep our forest? That's the wicked problem that, that we all have in front of us is how we um, manage curry dieback in an adaptive way and that we don't have all the answers. But it is about um, maintaining the forest. For locals in the, in the Waitakere ranges, for example, in your ward, um, we will have 25.5 kilometres of tracks reopened again this year. So we are addressing that issue and um, after consultation with the public around a prioritised accelerated opening of those tracks. So we are pushing very hard. Mm -hmm. I was also just thinking to supplement that. I mean, once we know more about the spread of the disease, because, you know, we're taking a precautionary approach at this stage, there has been uh, quite a significant increase in research investment in Kauri dieback from the Crown. So we get to a point where we have a better understanding of the relationship between foot traffic and the disease um, in terms of preventing the spread. We know it's important to keep people away from those currently diseased areas and to some extent with the healthy areas as well. But I'm just thinking that there could be in the future, you know, options for tracks that aren't, you know, that aren't foot traffic is not threatening that particular forest because there's no curry there or it's a distance away and we could be a bit more fine-tuned about the advice we're giving and the support we're giving to people that want that rugged experience. But I just don't think we're there yet in terms of understanding of the disease to, to make that call. Thank you. And I guess, Madam Chair, just because I won't speak again, but just to say, I think I want to thank all of you and your teams because it has been, it is still early days in the long history and research of what needs to be known, um, whether it ever is a cure, that um, you have responded to the community and having, um, you know, consultation about what which track should be open. And, and it's not answering everybody's needs, but I think there's been a good spread and the ones you have opened have been really good standard um, and it means people can get back into this. I just want to thank both Biosecurity and Parks for that work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. And just the last bit, we all voted to support the Rahui and the work that is being done is being done in partnership with Te Kaurau Amaki. And just because people are grumpy doesn't mean we suddenly just slide out of supporting the Rahui. That partnership still exists. And I just want to acknowledge the staff who are working with huge integrity around the Rahui that seems to have kind of been forgotten now by the loud voices to open all the tracks. We, we can't simply ignore that decision, nor would it be appropriate to. I've got Councillor Filipina and then Member Blair. Oh, thank you, Chair. And just a question, and also want to acknowledge the work. Look, it's interesting, and, and, and I wouldn't mind a comment from uh, whether it be um, the three, around us within Council working together to achieve what you've just outlined. I'll be interested to see whether, in fact, that is happening, and if so, um, your comments around uh, the work uh, with all our departments. Kevinda. Uh, thank you, Councillor Filipino, through the chair. Look, absolutely, uh, particularly in those three large programs I was talking about, the Kari dieback work, the work to support our community groups, and the work in the parks. That's what we call our co-delivery program. So we've essentially got teams from those key departments, which I had on the um, presentation there, working collectively. We've got uh, joined up decision making around investment in those programs. We've got joined up reporting. We've got joined up financial tracking. So particularly in those areas. Some of the other areas, like for example, the marine biosecurity work, that's more independent, that's sitting within environmental services as the experts in biosecurity. But the three largest programs we're co-delivering with parks and community facilities in particular. And I mean, sometimes I feel like that's new ground. Uh, there are other areas of council that work that way, but it's new ground for us. But um, I think at the end of the first year, we can say, um, you know, good start. Absolutely.
Councillor Cooper and Councillor Filipino, I wondered if you would like to put your name to this recommendation. And I'm going to suggest a B, because this is our first report back on this, um, these two targeted rates that we add a thanks to all the teams involved in making this happen. Um, so that'll be those two. We'll move it. Okay, I'm just trying to kind of keep things moving because we are we are running out of time. We've got a lot of speakers. Greg? Yeah, so just to make the point that the, the water quality targeted rate has really been the glue to hang all of the programs together and we've had wonderful support from not only the wider council family but also so many other uh, parties outside of council that have contributed to the success. And if it wasn't for the targeted rate, I don't think we'd have the same focus. Thanks, Craig. So I've got Member Blair, Simpson and Lee. So we'll combine comments and questions. Yeah, just a thanks, Madam Chair and echo your, your uh, comments on the Rahui uh, with Te Kaurau Maki and Ngāti Whātua's there to support. So uh, that was a momentous occasion to see uh, the complete reversal almost on, on, um, on the saving of the Kodi. Um, so congratulate your team, Mason and others for that, for being there to do that, along with the pest eradication uh, and track improvements. Also happy to assist more for the Mātauranga Māori. Uh, I think the Kaitaki Forum can help there too, um, to add to your level of knowledge in there. And just a quick, you know, on my wall hangs the uh, Kahu Bay, uh, the village in pre you know, just the arrival of the colonialism and then another photo I've got is the building of the sewage pump that pumped into Kahu Bay. So I want to commit and the deaths that happened around that and the typhoid that was spread because it was contaminated the bay. But I do want you to encourage you to keep going because that's what drives us every day at Ngāti Whātua. Uh, and on Saturday I welcome you to a Karakia for the because the removal of the boats, the moored boats in Okahu Bay, which is perhaps the most sacred um, bay of the of the union between Pākehā and Māori, happened there. So we're happy to invite you to that, and indeed all councillors to signify that. So kia kaha team. Thank you, Madam Chair, and look, congratulations to all of you. This is outstanding. Um, I'm trying to get a couple of you know. Uh, famous lines that I can uh, speak uh, to promote what we've been doing here. So my questions are, is this the largest investment in any year to both our natural environment and our water quality in any, in, in this, um, for Auckland Council? Uh, simple answer on water quality, uh, yes, for healthy waters. Yeah, likewise for the natural environment, uh, Councillor Simpson, we could get back to you as well just to determine whether it's the largest investment in the country, but we have to be careful about the, the skiting part of it, but it is a significant investment and certainly the largest for Auckland Council. So that actually was my second question, and I don't think you should be afraid to skite. I think this is um, contrary to the last discussion we've had. This is something that we should skite about, actually. Um, you know, people have voted... They are now seeing, um, both as, as part of the long-term plan consultation for this uh, targeted rate, we got it, and now we are delivering. So I think you should be yelling it from the rooftops, as so should we all. So, Madam Chair, um, I'm happy just to know any more sort of the best of the best ever <laughs> facts that they can come out, because I think that's something that we should all promote. Well done, team. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Um, on the attachment A, there's a, a case study, a Winyard Basin in Freeman's Bay, and it's got the wording there, and I'm not sure whether that wording is right, but it might be. Um, currently, combined overflows are spilling into the network approximately, approximately over 92 times a year. Are you talking about the stormwater network or you're talking about spilling into the harbour and streams 92 times a year? I'm talking, that's referring to the combined sewer overflows which go out of the 
water key network into the stormwater network into the harbour. That's the current. So when you say spilling into the network, this the combined overflows are spilling into the storm. Are spilling into the harbour, really, aren't they? The, not into the network. From well, they the spill network. into the network through the through the network into the harbour. Okay. Um, in in terms of the separation of of stormwater and sewage in St Mary's Bay, you, you say that's contingent on the outcome of the um, Environment Court mediation discussions. Could you explain that that a bit more? Separation is not. Uh, is, is not subject to the uh, mediation process. The separation is an agreed project which water care, which is already up and running. The only issue that's at dispute is the actual need for the stormwater tunnel, which is currently okay. mediated on. The, 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 the slide didn't... That's what I understood, and so I was a little bit puzzled by the, the comment in, in the slide. Can I ask you... So the separation of a stormwater... Um, and sewage or wastewater in St Mary's Bay, which was half completed more or less by uh, by Auckland City, um, is going to be completed separately from any discussions about the St Mary's Bay tunnel. Correct. Okay. And can I ask you then, we and we'll, can we assume that after St Mary's Bay has been separated, then Hearn Bay will have its separation completed? Does it work that way? Correct. Thank you very much. Okay, and finally, Councillor Hill. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I just want to um, basically thank the, the teams, and the teams are wide. Um, we have had significant uh, work done on the shore, protecting our Cody, especially. You know, the, unfortunately, at the same time as this passed, we got a few confirmed cases of. Cody dieback in Kaipataki, which um, obviously was horrendous news, but we were ready to go with sectioning off those tracks and also protecting um, the areas where we had no um, confirmed cases and have protected a lot of Cody and the the track development and stations and other things that have, have come up um, already are pretty phenomenal. Um, and the amount of money and support for our pest uh, groups that have applied for funds and, and have got that off the ground. We had another workshop in the weekend on water quality for Takapuna, Milford, the Waido Estuary, uh, Castor Bay, and you know where there are serious issues on water quality. And of course, there are people who uh, think it's not enough, but this is a huge uh, direction we're moving. And to have this funding available to do the work to do the forensic investigations. And I think in Takapuna, we've fixed 35 of the 40 identified problems in one year. So, which is quite phenomenal work. There's a lot of people on the ground um, doing that. And I just wanted to Sorry. sort of thank you um, all for that work. But I will say that because we section out the two water quality targeted rates, I don't think we necessarily tell the whole story of what council was doing or what it can confuse it a bit when we don't connect up yes that's happening in the water quality space but there is also this work being done by healthy waters this work being done by parks i don't know how we weave those messages in for the next term of council but it's important that people think like that's not it like there is this is the extra bonuses that we managed to put into and escalate in the last year but there's a lot of work that is currently going on and was already planned, um, so how we weave those messages together for the future, that it's current works and then water quality work, I don't know. But, yeah, some people can get confused and go, well, what, what's happening here or there? Um, and often when it's under the ground, no one knows the investment's happening. So, thank you. I think, and that's an issue that's been raised, I think when we comms this, we need to say this is the on top of, there's all the ordinary day-to-day -day BAU big investment that happens, this extra work is facilitated by the two targeted rates. Okay, it's been moved. Oh, Councillor Clough. As Chair of Finance, I was happy to move this because it's a great success, but you've got someone, have you? You can have it. Good, Councillor Clough. Can add that to your... We can add that to your... Huge list of good stuff. Councillor Clow will move and someone else will second. I'll let Councillor Filipina and Councillor Cooper battle it out. Clow can... 
I'm our brother. Brother. Hang on a minute. We we want we've got one more item to do before the brother lunch break. Mother, mother. Councillor Clo can second. I mean, can move. Councillor Cooper can second. Done. I'm going to put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you, and thank you, team, most warmly. We're going to do our item 11, and then we'll take a break, team. So Gail will stay, and we've got Ricky and Sophie. I just want to acknowledge Sophie Highway particularly. This is Sophie's last meeting with us. With me. I thought you were saying it was your last meeting with us. I was going to go, you going to do something else. I want to acknowledge the fact that this may be my last meeting with oh. Sophie. This is very important. That's why I looked so stricken when Sophie said it's my last meeting. I thought, actually, Sophie, you didn't know this was your last meeting. <laughs> Okay, back the truck up. Obviously, obviously, caffeine and um, sugar deprivation are kicking in. Welcome to everybody who is going to be here with us for a very long time. Am I going to hand over to you, Soph? <laughs> Okay. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, ka Sophie Ho Heiwe Tokawingo. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ricky Stanich, who's a senior low carbon specialist in my team, and of course you know Gail. Um, so this report is to request your approval to um, changes to the voluntary targeted rate to retrofit your home. Um, I'll take the report as read. Um, the approvals we're seeking are the um, addition of eight new interventions to the programme, the removal of one. Um, and to note that we are investigating alternative um, funding models for this program in the future. Um, we have prepared a couple of slides um, just to give you some information about who uh, uses this program um, and how it aligns to national and uh, local strategies. So um, obviously healthy home standards um, have recently been adopted which require um, increased levels of healthy homes which is great. Uh, the Residential Tenancies Act also and the Healthy Homes Program which is um, a national level Ministry of Health partnership program that we have been involved with through TSI. Um, there are regional programs for owner occupiers and landlords, this is um, where we target this, so obviously as a voluntary targeted rate, uh, but there are also lots of other um, programs that we offer to uh, lower income and uh, owner occupiers and uh, warmer Kiwi Homes is one of those and that's an ECA led program. Then we also have the um, healthy, uh, uh, healthy rentals on the next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, and also, we've recently run a Healthy Homes campaign to let landlords uh, know about the recent changes to the standards that they are now required to improve the quality of their housing. So we've done quite a lot of social, as you can see there, um, to raise that awareness and obviously offer these um, programs that we have available. Huh. Uh, we also have local board programs, a, a significant investment into um, Healthy Homes program, which is for... Um, a range of uh, homeowners and renters. Um, healthy rentals, obviously, one f um, for, for people who are renting. Um, so significant investment there at a local level. Um, this is the distribution of people who are taking up the targeted rate scheme, retrofit your home, um, as you'll see predominantly in the west and south, which we're really pleasantly surprised with. Um, and just finally a little bit about um, the type of um, health impacts. Um, you guys are well aware of this, we've presented to you before about the health impacts. Um, but uh, applicant ethnicity for this program is um, predominantly, well, 50% New Zealand European, but also a high uptake from the Pacific and Maori um, population, uh, Indian and other, just to give you a sense of who's using this. Any questions? Right, questions. Thank you for putting up the demographic and the access issues. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. It's about the gas flu, and I guess I, I might know the answer, but just to be clear, that was something that was there before, but is it because we've found now that it, you know, gas isn't really the, the best type of heating, a lot of emissions, etc., and we flued because it wasn't safe to have the emissions inside, it caused dampness and suffocation is that what so are we taking it out because it's just not 
the most efficient form of heating and we'd rather people win a different way. So when we did the review of this program, we were looking to ensure that the outcome achieved a low carbon, a low carbon outcome was yeah. the prerogative. So yeah, now. with fluid gas, you've got methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So that immediately discounted it from the scheme. So, it's, just, so in terms of that, we've moved on in time and in our research and what the outcomes are, as additional outcomes other than just keeping people warm. Good. Thank you. All good. Any other questions? Um, Member Blair. Oh, thank you. Uh, put that on. Uh, thank you, team. Uh, just noting that, what's the, um, how do we get more uptake of the Māori to access these loans? And also, could you talk a bit about the economics of it in terms of is the interest rate, you know, the interest on it and things like that, and repayment scheme? So currently the interest rate um, that we offer through the scheme is pegged to council's cost of borrowing, which is 5% roughly. Uh, it's variable, so it'll shift up and down slightly. But it's, so we say it's between 6 and 7%. In terms of um, getting greater Māori uptake, uh, well, we are aware that a lot of the people who are affected positively are the renters. So we're targeting landlords to make sure that they're aware of the scheme. Um, and we're also making sure that through the RFP process, um, we are requiring a minimum of 10% of the business to be awarded to Māori-owned businesses, assuming that they can achieve the standards of quality assurance and customer service that the program requires. Just a supplementary or a suggestion as to um, a lot of iwi have rental homes, and so perhaps we could facilitate you getting in touch with them to improve their homes for their people that are living in them, because they're generally uh, low socioeconomic homes, but could do with an uplift, um, you know, to create healthier homes, because quite often it's left to the iwi, but if they can point their people in the right direction to access this loans, I think that'd be a great, great uh, step. Yeah, thanks. We'd really encourage that. And um, noted the earlier um, item about Māori um, uh, Marae development and would be keen to go through that program as well, but we'd, we'd be keen to work with you on how we would extend that. Thanks. Good offer. Councillor Collins. No? We had you, we had you here. Councillor Clough. On that ethnic mix, there was no no mention of Chinese. So this, was there a rationale for that, as higher home ownership themselves, or what? Um, I don't think we can. I, I know they're probably under under that. Um, yeah, they're in there. Um, they're actually in the other section. Um, previously, they were they were you know kind of there as uh, they were noted, but now it's um. If you go, can you flip back can to Can we go side? back to the presentation? It's just more in proportion to the Indian population. Yeah. So we found, through looking through the analysis, we found that there's very low uptake by Chinese, Asian, and that's why we've actually targeted the Healthy Homes campaign at that demographic, because they are quite a majority landlord, um, and yet there's very low uptake. So we really are targeting that market segment. Um, so they are represented in the other, so that's 8%, but that's Chinese, other Asian, South African... Yeah, Chinese are more than there are more Chinese in India, and that's what I'm noticing there. So clearly, you do need to target them. Yeah, and and we uh, are. Yeah. Whether they're landlords themselves or. Yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Are you tracking those ones that are landlords? Whether they've increased the rent for their um, tenants as a result of the um, the scheme. Thank you. No, we don't track resulting increases. It's you know it's literally a loan scheme and, and people pay back. We don't track um, increases in rent. But um, I I know there's anecdotally there's um, been cases of that. Um, it's probably outside the scope of the project. But yeah, yeah, yeah. The side effect um, that perhaps mm. wouldn't benefit people. Um, with the increase in rent. Anyway, it's also good to see the. Um, you're not going with the flu gas option because that's banned in some parts in Australia yeah. anyway, so good yeah. to see it. Thank you. I think we've run out of questions. Um, would you like to move, yeah. Councillor Filipina? Is there a seconder? Oh, no, hang on. Councillor... No. 
we're going to have the same battle. Councillor Philippine is moving. Councillor Member Blair, would you like to second? Member Blair is going to second. I'll put that all in those all favour. All those in favour. Sorry, I'm still getting over my big faux pas <laughs> with Sophie. I'm still feeling a bit shy and embarrassed. Um, I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, allowing me to be in one of your last committee meetings. Indeed. <laughs> and just, I just had a text from someone saying, what do you mean that's the last meeting? It's not. We've got one more, but one I just more, clarified. I just Sophie and I <laughs> might not have um, a, a shared item at the next one. So on that point, I'm going to call an adjournment for half an hour and we'll